Hi, church. Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day. Isn't it a great day to be in God's house? Honor the Father in the Father's house. Amen. We're going to celebrate dads and we're going to celebrate the Father this morning. But let's stand, open up with a word of prayer as we go in. We got something kind of neat together and you're going to have to do your best to stick with us. Um, our first song is going to be kind of a, a medley conglomeration of some different hymns. And uh, one verse, you'll figure it out. You might not be able to follow it, um, but uh, just do your best to stay with us, okay? Amen. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, Lord, happy Father's Day to you. We thank you for being our good, good Father. Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, that you would just bless us with your presence here. Father, let us know beyond any shadow of a doubt, Lord, that we are in the Father's house. Lord, I pray to God that we've all had weeks, Father, this week. We've, we've experienced some ups and some downs, some anxieties, some worries. Father, we've dealt with some disappointments, some pains. And Father, I pray that all of the things that we have had to struggle through this week, just barely keeping our heads above the water, I pray that, Lord, you'd help us just for a little bit this morning in your house experience freedom in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Be with our singing, our worship this morning, God. Be with the preaching this morning, Lord. And let us walk out of here at the end of our time together knowing that we have been in the presence of a loving Father. And we just give you praise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You can keep standing or you can sit, whatever you're comfortable with, but just worship the Lord this morning.
good. We're going to sing another one. The theme for the, the day is the love of the Father. I'm going to be preaching here in just a little bit about the love of the Father. And so as we're going to sing this next one, it's another hymnal. It's uh, heavenly love because the love that we receive from the Father is unlike any other. And we'll learn a little more about that in a moment, but let's sing this together. thankful this morning for that heavenly love of God. How about you? It is that heavenly love that makes absolutely the difference in our life. It is Father's Day and we, we want to honor all of the fathers that are here. We want to thank all of the daddies for being here today. And I was thinking about Father's Day and one of the, when you think about a dad, there's a few things that, that come to your mind about dads and one of them is dad jokes. How many of you dads are good dad joke tellers? I feel like Steve, you are. It could happen. It could happen. Dad jokes are fantastic. I love dad jokes, and I don't know when it came to be that I love dad jokes. It might have been October the 16th, the year 2000, when a little boy came into this world and the magical powers of daddy hit me. And all of a sudden, I was able to understand dad jokes and found them chuckly, but now I can tell them. And I have a challenge for you this morning as, as we get into the message. I want to tell a few dad jokes, and I want to challenge you not to laugh or moan. You're already laughing. Sure, you're already laughing. 
All right, no laughing, no moaning and groaning either. Starting now. All right, you ready for this? What did the drummer call his twin daughter? Anna one, Anna two. You fail. You got to leave. How did Darth Vader know what Luke got him for Christmas? He could feel his presence. I wanted to go on a diet, but I feel like I already have too much on my plate right now. Okay, now I miss the laughter because I don't know if this is working or not. I know. Uh, Want to hear a joke about construction? Not yet. I'm still working on it. Uh, what was Forrest Gump's Facebook password? One Forrest One. I like this one. What sound does a witch's car make? Broom, broom. What does a zombie vegetarian eat? Grains. Well, this seemed like a really good idea when I was studying this out this week. What does a nosy pepper do? He gets jalapeno your business. Uh, guys who like to tell dad jokes but they don't have any kids, yeah, they're faux pas. How do celebrities stay cool? Yeah, it's just kind of dumb. How do cele uh, celebrities stay cool? They got lots of fans. Uh, what do you call, some of you will get this and some of you will not. You'll have to ask your kids and grandkids. What do you call Batman when he skips church? Christian Bale. My son, the Batman junkie, is about to fall to pieces. Uh, did you hear about the man who fell into the upholstery machine? Don't worry. Um, he's fully recovered. One check, thanks. Uh, last one, and then I'll let you go. Uh, why didn't the melons get married? Because they're cantaloupe. Sam, am I fired? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. All right, let's get serious, though. I like having fun on Father's Day, and, uh, you know, fathers, sometimes we get, a, we get a silly rap, but if it wasn't for daddies, man, we'd be in a mess. Um, I want to look in the book of Luke, chapter 15, and I know that it's a familiar passage of Scripture, but the story of the prodigal son, as it has been come to known, is actually probably one of the most important teaching tools that Jesus used while he was on this earth. It was probably one of the most important messages that he gave while he was walking this planet. And as I have studied the story of the prodigal son over the last several years, and I've preached on it, you know, I, I usually preach on it uh, at least once a year just because of how important it is uh, in its context and in what it's uh, trying to teach us about the, the characters of the story. But I want us to look at it in a little bit of a different light this morning as we study it out. And the reason for that is, is we're going to focus on the Father this morning. It is Father's Day, and a lot of times when you come to church on Father's Day, the, the pastor, the preacher, whoever's delivering the message, he, he does a lot of talking about how to be a good dad and, and what a good dad looks like and what a, what a Christian father looks like and all of that. And, and, and I don't want to talk about us dads today. I want to talk about the father, the ultimate dad. And the reason that I think we need to look at the ultimate father, the love of the father this morning, is because we fail to understand sometimes the importance of the role of a father. I looked up these statistics, and they, they kind of shocked me when I read them. I had suspicions on some of them, but they, they kind of shocked me as I read them. Forty-three. This is in the United States. 43% of all children live in a home without their birth father. That seems high. 90%, 90% of runaway and homeless children are from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts are from a fatherless household. The percentage of minors in prison who grew up without a father is 85%. The percentage of adolescents in substance abuse treatment facilities who are from fatherless homes is 
of youth suicides happen in households with an absent father. When you look at these statistics, it's fairly obvious that the presence and the love of a father can be a life-changing element in a child's life. It, it, it determines sometimes their character, how they grow up, the kind of personalities that they have. It, it, it's often determined by the presence of a father in their life. And so as I was looking at these statistics and kind of going over some thoughts that I had in my mind, I began to think, well, then what kind of fatherly influence do we need to have in our life today. And I believe that Jesus gives us the perfect example of a father's love here in Luke chapter 15. We're going to read Luke chapter 15, verse 11, all the way down through verse number 24. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, all the way down to verse number 24. Jesus is talking. He's been talking about lost things being found. And here in verse number 11, he says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Now I want to stop you right here and lay out the foundation of what I'm going to be talking about this morning here. In verse 11, Jesus names the object, the subject of this story that he is telling. We often place the importance of this story on the son and the fact that he left and all the things that he did and then the fact that he decided to come back and we call this the story, the story of the prodigal son. But the truth is it's not about the young son and it's not about the the older son who was out in the field and never left the father, this story that Jesus is telling, he lays it out right there. He says, I want to tell you about a man. I want to talk about a man who had two sons. That lays out what Jesus was showing to us there in the verses here because he was saying, I'm talking about a dad. I'm talking about a father. Now, when you look in the context of what Jesus is talking about, and when you read the remainder of the verses here that he uses in Luke chapter 15, what you find is that it's not just any man that Jesus is talking about. He is giving an example of God the Father who had children who operated in one of two ways according to the youngest son and the way he's described and the older son and the way that he is described. And so I think it's important for us to get get an understanding there in verse number 11 that Jesus is telling a story about our heavenly father. So he says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And when he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He arose, came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his finger, on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. You see, what I find here in this story is the story of a father's love for his children. And you can go on and you can read the remainder of the chapter. I'm trying to keep us short here because I know that you fellas, you've got flesh to put on the grill today. Amen. 
So in, in honor of that, you look through the rest of the story and you see that the love of the father was not just bestowed upon the younger son, but it was bestowed upon the other son as well, the son that stayed, the son that was remaining out in the field, that was working his father's farm, his father's cattle. And so when you see that this father has love for both of his children, you see the kind of complex kind of love that the father in heaven has for us his kids kids. Now here's the problem. I feel like that sometimes we fail to fully grasp and understand the entire love that God has for you and for me. We cannot fully sometimes understand the kind of love that God has. And when we try to understand it, here's what we do, church. We take the love of God and we try to humanize it. We try to Americanize it. We try to say, well, this is how I would operate if I were God. This is the way that I show my kids and my grandkids that I love them. And so when we do that, we fail to truly grasp the kind of love that God has. What we are doing instead is is we are trying to project what we think God is all about or how we think that God would love us. Remember, we we talked last Sunday morning that every man is right in his own eyes, but God weighs our hearts. So we might think that we understand the love of God, but I believe that what Jesus was doing here was laying out a pattern of events for us to truly have a glimpse into the window of how God operates. And I've heard people say this before, Brother Sam. They'll say, well, if God was so loving, then why does he allow whatever? Or people will say, if God is truly a loving God, then why is there so much hatred and evil in the world? And every reason that they give for why they can't understand how a loving God would allow or a loving God would permit or that things would exist if a loving God exists, it's because they're trying to see the love of God through the lens of their own fallen and dark and sinful and messed up heart. They try to say, well, if God was love, no, the kind of love that they're trying to place on God is a humanistic love. It's a materialistic love. It's a conditional love because the kind of love that human beings have is this. I love you until you mess up. I love you until it's no longer convenient for me. I love you until you do something I disagree with. And so in all of that, whenever we see that someone has those thoughts of, man, how is, if God is so loving, why does all this, uh, this hatred and bitterness and evilness exist in the world? It's because we fully do not grasp the love that God has. You see, when what Jesus is doing is the same thing that God has been doing from the start of the book and continues all the way to the end of Revelations, and that is revealing who God is, His character, the kind of characteristics that He has. And when we understand the character of God, then we're able to fully understand better the, the, the kind of love that God has. Because yes, God loves us fully. And they say, well, if God is love and He's so loving, then why does evil and negative Negative things happen in the world. Here's why. Because God's love gave us permission to live out our lives according to our free will that he gave us. You see, love doesn't bust down doors. Love doesn't interfere. Love doesn't force itself upon an individual. When you have someone in this world that attempts to force their love on someone else, you got to get a lawyer. And God in his character, being a father, being a, being a, a truth-telling and a polite God allows us to go through certain things because that was the choice that we made. When you look all the way back in the book of Genesis in the garden, in chapter number 3, we see that God's creation is tainted because mankind chose themselves. Over God's word. God's command was that they would be cast out. Now you think about this. We say, well, why is it that God had to cast them out? Because of their choice that they made. 
And from that choice made until where we're at today in the year 2020, we understand that we have been falling generation after generation. Darkness has been encompassing this world. And in the beginning when God gave us the keys of authority to this earth, we turned right around and gave those keys to the enemy. So for us to stand back and try and humanize God's love, and say, well, if God was so loving, then, th then these things would not truly exist. God has given us permission to live how we live. There will be uh, repercussions for our choices, but God is a gentleman, and he allows us to go through the things that we do. But when you see that God's love is fair, and as we talked last Sunday, God's love is just and you look in these words here in these verses, you see that the Father's love for us is something pretty spectacular when you really look at how God loves us. So what is God's love like? Uh, I, I love this question, and I love the answers that God gave me throughout the week. Number one, God's love is extra extravagant. The love of the Father is extravagant. You say, what does that mean, Pastor Casey? What does that mean? One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1, and it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. I love that. He starts that verse with an exclamation. Behold, in other words, can you believe what we're seeing here? Do you see how much God loves us? Behold the extra some some versions of that verse, some modern translations actually use the word extravagant right there. Behold the extravagant kind of love that the Father lavishes upon us because we are his children. Understand this morning that the love of God is an extravagant love. It's a love that goes beyond borders. It's a love that, that goes beyond our understanding. And when you look at the definition of a loving father that Jesus gives here in Luke chapter 15, you see a father who is an extravagant giver. See what he means, Brother Casey. The father is a giver. When the boy asks in verse number 12, he says, Daddy, I want you to give me what's coming to me, my inheritance, and I want to live my own life outside of your rule and outside of your law. Can I tell you, doesn't that sound like humanity today? We want God's blessings and we want God's provisions and we want God to give us prosperity. But when it comes right down to it, we don't want to spend any time in the house of God. We don't want to spend any time in the presence of God. We don't want to spend any time honoring the, 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 the character of God. And so when you look at that and you see that this boy in verse number 12 comes to his dad and says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. It's almost a slap in the face. He's basically telling his father, Dad, I wish you were dead now so I could go ahead and get what's coming to me materialistically. And the father doesn't argue. I love this. And God showed me this, and I've never really paid much attention to this before. Not that I haven't noticed it, but not that I haven't seen the, the, the significance of what happens right there. Because, Brother Joe, when the boy comes to him and says, Dad, I want my inheritance, what does the father respond with? It says at the end of verse number 12, so he divided his inheritance and he gave to them. So the youngest son comes to the father and says, Dad, I want my inheritance. The dad didn't sit him down and have a long talk. The dad didn't try and explain how things work in Jewish custom. The dad didn't try and whoop his hind end like I think he probably should have. Hey, man, dads, come on now. But the Bible says that when the son came to him and asked for his inheritance, the dad said, okay, and he gave. And he gave not only to the younger son, but he gave to his older son as well. That shows to me that he is an extravagant giver. Can I tell you something? God loves extravagantly. If you don't believe that God has blessed you, then you're just not paying attention because God is an extravagant giver in our life. He said there again in 1 John 3 and 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you. God loves you with a great big love, with an extravagant love. You say, how big does God love us? 
How much does he give for us? Can I tell you, God loves so extravagantly that he left all of heaven to come to this earth and live on this earth and experience the pains and the hurts and the loss the same as you and I do. And then he took on the sin and the punishment and the wrath of God upon himself as he hung on the cross suspended between heaven and earth. He gave everything that he was so that you and I would not have to experience that kind of loss ourselves. I tell you, all of us dads in this room have said at one time or another, I'd die for my babies. And I'd like to, since the camera's on, say the same, I'd die for my kids. I'd say it when the camera's not on either. I thought y'all would laugh, but now I just feel weird. But it's apparent that none of us in here this morning have ever had to stand in front of a bullet for our children. We're all still here. We say that we give all. God did. God gave all. God gave everything that he was, everything that he has. Romans 8 and 32 says that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God freely gave himself for us. John 3, 16, we know what it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's love moved him to be a giver. God's love is extravagant. He doesn't just sprinkle little bits of blessings here and there, but God's love is absolutely extravagant. It goes beyond anything you and I could ever expect or imagine. Fast forward to when the boy is coming home. The Bible says that the father sees him from a distance, runs out to where he's at, and what does the father say? The father says, get him a robe and get him a ring and get him a, uh, some shoes on his feet and go out and slaughter the fattest cow we got because we're about to have a party. My son is home. He didn't demand a receipt for all the things that the son had done. He didn't ask for a list of excuses. He simply saw his boy coming back to him and the father's first response was to give extravagantly to him. It's important that we understand that God's love is extravagant. And I've heard people say, well, does God just love the Christian? And then the answer is no. You know, religion will teach you that God loves those who serve him. And that's the truth. But God also loves those who deny his existence. God also loves those who live as though he does not exist. You say, preacher, I don't understand that. God loved the world. He so loved the world. It didn't say that he so loved the saint. It didn't say that he so loved the church. It said that he so loved the world. That's every human being in existence. That's every race, color, creed, and culture. That's everybody, no matter how good they were in our eyes or how bad they were in our eyes. That is every single person. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do to make God stop loving you. The love of God is a pursuing love. It's an extravagant love that will seek you out where you're at no matter where you're at in your life, no matter what part of your journey that you're on, no matter what you're dealing with, and no matter what you were doing last night, God's love will pursue you extravagantly. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, he said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves you beyond any limit, beyond any of our imaginations. He loves you extravagantly. He is an extravagant giver in your life. God loves you you this morning not only that number two God's love has no plan B I heard that statement this week and it hasn't I haven't been able to shake it God's love has no plan B you say preacher what, what do you mean about that what, what do you mean God's love had no plan B notice that the father didn't argue he gave he wasn't questioning, he gave. 
while the son was away living riotously. We know the story about the son. We shouldn't have to go over all of that. We know that he lived it. He parted it away. He, he gave it away. He lived it riotously until he had nothing left to give. He had to pawn his clothes. He had to pawn his jewelry. He had to sell himself into servitude so that he could have enough food to eat. And he wasn't even eating as good as the pigs that he was feeding. We understand that. But the whole time that the son is away, the father, I believe, is standing out on the porch every day waiting for a glimpse of that son. Waiting for him to come walking back down the pathway towards the house. Listen, he gave extravagantly and he loved enduringly. Listen, he might have had reports come back every now and again. Yeah, we saw your boy the other day and you wouldn't believe how he looked. The father didn't stop loving him. Yeah, we heard about what your son did to you. My goodness, what a slap in the face. Sold the family land. Sold it to outsiders. Man, what a slap in the face. The father never stopped loving his son. You know, there's something that I told my kids, and it's a conversation that Xander and I have a lot, and if he was awake, I'd have him confirm that. But he's out. My preaching is real good this morning, I can tell. Happy Father's Day. Uh, but I tell him a lot at nighttime before he goes to bed, you're my son, and there's nothing that you could ever possibly do that could make me stop loving you. There's nothing in the world that that boy could do. And he'll say, Dad, what if I steal something? I said, I love you the same. You know why? Because I'm still your son. I said, that's right. That boy knows beyond any doubt that no matter what he's going through, no matter what he's done, I love him. I love him. And that's the kind of love that the father here in Luke 15 had for his younger son. He didn't care about the way that he was living. He didn't care. I mean, he was concerned. Don't misunderstand. But it did not change the fact that he loved that boy. And when the boy come walking back to the house, what did it say that the father did? The father ran to him. There was no plan B. The father didn't send out help. The father wasn't trying to change the boy's mind. The father knew that this was all that needed to happen. Listen, we have plan B in our life, in our day-to-day -day life. We have plan B's. If something doesn't work out, we'll fall back on plan B. We'll fall back on, my, our, on our money or our credit cards or our insurance. We'll fall back on drugs and alcohol. We'll fall back. We're filled with plan B's, with the maybes, with the might be's. We're implying all the time that we believe that what's going on is not going to work out and because we're ready to fall back on the plan B. God never created a plan B and you you find it in scripture. Let me just share this with you quickly. We find it in scripture that God's plan all along was to send Jesus because of his love for us. In Genesis chapter 3, God tells Adam and Eve that separation from him is going to be hard, but then he also gave them good news. He said from Eve will come an offspring and this offspring will crush Satan. Can I tell you something? God, all the way in the beginning, before he ever had to send them out of the garden, was already dropping hints. I love you, and I've got a plan, and that plan's not going to change. Later in Genesis, God promises Abraham in Genesis 12 and 2, I will make you into a great nation, and through your, your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Once again, God was setting something up big because through the nation of Abraham, through that lineage came his son Jesus. In the Mosaic Covenant, God gives Moses the law and the sacrificial system. That is an arrow that is pointing to the need for a perfect sacrifice. But the law made nothing perfect. Do you understand what that means right there? God was telling them the only way to get things back on track is going to come through the perfect sacrifice. But the law that God also gave them said that nothing on this earth was perfect. There was no animal. There was no dove. All of that was just a measly substitution. God was setting up the people to understand that his plan of love was coming. Finally, there's King David. God promised David that his kingdom would endure forever before God and David's throne would be established forever. It is through David's offspring that God said would spring up the Messiah. And we see that 
because of Jesus being born through the lineage of King David even though there were prostitutes that were included in that lineage God's plan never changed God's plan from the beginning was always the same from the foundations of the earth God's love had no substitute he loved you so much that he was willing to send his son and he wasn't going to do anything but that because of his love for you The love that God has for you was always working towards his only plan. There was going to be no substitute that would measure up. I'm going to read this that I read this week by Corey Asbury. If you've ever heard the the song, uh, The Reckless Love of God, and I know some don't like the terminology of that, but just listen to what he had to say. He's the one that wrote this, Corey Asbury. He said, there's no plan B with the love of God. He gives his heart so completely, so preposterously, that if refused, we would think it irreparably broken. Yet he gives himself away again and again and again, time and time again. There was no plan B with the love of God. Nothing could shake the love of God. Nothing could stop the love of God. And nothing could stop the plan of God in your life. Listen, God's love, the Father's love for you, it had no substitute because the love of God is enough to change our direction. Lastly, and I'll be done. God's love is restorative. The love of the Father is restorative. This is important for us to get because of all the things the Father gave his son when he came back to the house. It says he gave him a robe, covered him up, gave him shoes on his feet. He was going to feed him the best meal he had had in however long he'd been gone. But then it says that the father said, get the ring. Get the ring. And put the ring on his finger. We might miss the significance of the ring that the father had to give to him. Because the ring signified which family you belong to. You know, our wedding rings that we wear today signify that we're taken. All the wives shouted amen signifies that nobody else can have him because he's mine. And if you ladies are like my lady, murder is not out of the idea, you know. They'll kill. They'll kill. Amen. The ring signifies love and connection and relationship. See, the ring in the Jewish customs, in the Jewish culture, the ring signified that he was a member of that father's family, had the family name on it, the family crest on it, so to speak. And the boy comes back to him, and he says something very important that I I don't want you to miss in Luke 21. The son said, and he rehearsed this, remember, as as he's coming home, he's he's rehearsing this over and over. This is what I'm going to say to my dad. Do you remember when you were a kid and you had to go have a talk with your dad and you didn't think it was going to work out well in your favor and you rehearsed the conversation? Amen. Come on now. You rehearsed the conversation. This is what I'm going to say. And I think this is what dad will say. And this is what I'm going to say in return. And I'm ready for the conversation. But the conversation never goes the way you thought it would. How many of you have won all kinds of arguments in the shower in the morning, but then you lost them when you got out? The conversation never goes the way that you expect it to go. The boy is walking back to his daddy's house, and he's rehearsing in his mind, God, I've sinned against God and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. He's saying, I don't even deserve for you to call me your son. I don't deserve to be a member of this family. My mistakes and my failures and the way that I've lived and the things that I did to you, Father, I don't deserve to be a part of this family. And that's exactly exactly what he says to his daddy. He rehearses it every step of the way. He gets back to his dad. Remember, the dad sees him from a distance because there was no plan B. The dad was expecting him daily to come walking back to the house. And when he finally sees him, the father runs to where he is and kisses his filthy cheek and loves on him. And he says, Dad, in verse number 21, he says, The son said unto the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. You know what he's saying to him right there? I've done too much wrong. I'm not worthy of your approval. 
I'm not worthy of your love. And you say, oh, but surely we know the Father loved him. Yeah, but doesn't that sound like us today? We, be, we believe that because of the things that we've done in our life that we're not worthy of God's love. We're not worthy of God's approval. We're not worthy to be a member of the family of God. We feel like that because of our mistakes and our failures that we don't belong to to God, that we've done too much for God to forgive us, that we've done too much, we've gone too far for God to bring us back. We feel like that we don't deserve to be saved. We don't deserve to be added or included into the family of God. And in the flip side of that, so many times we look at the mistakes of other people and we say that because of what they did, they don't deserve to be saved. They don't deserve to be a member of the family of God. They don't, they're don't. they not worthy of God's approval. Man, a lot of churches talk that way today, don't they? That we look at the mistakes of those around us and act like we don't have any mistakes or mess-ups or darkness in our own life. And we say, yes, we're worthy of God's love, but I know what you did last night. I know what you did last week. And you're not worthy to be in our church. You're not worthy to be a part of the family of God. Can I tell you, this young man didn't feel like he was worthy to be called a son but he came back still yet seeking a father and that's the heart of every human being on the face of the planet we are seeking a father figure in our life and the father when he sees him he runs to him because the father's ready for us to come back see when the son came back to the father and the son recognized and confessed to the dad his unworthiness the father did something that the son never expected he called for the ring What this means is that I'm sure that when the boy left, he had the ring. But now that he's coming back, he doesn't have the ring. You know what that tells me? That tells me that he he fell on those hard times, and the first thing he did was find a pawn shop. And he pawned the ring that signified he belonged to his daddy's house. The father didn't say, son, where's your ring? The father said, Let me get you a ring. You know what that means? Restoration into the family. That's the way that the Father loves you this morning. The Father loves you so much that He doesn't care about how you've lived. He doesn't care about the things that you did. He doesn't care about the mistakes that you've made. He doesn't care about the darkness in your life. And He doesn't care what you did with the family ring. He just wants to restore you back into the family. You see, that is amazing to me because this shows me that once again, the extravagant love of God, the 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 plan only love of God, the, the restorative love of God is a love that is greater than our failures it's greater than our losses it's greater than our abuses it's greater than our mistakes it's greater than our riotous living it's greater than the darkness I have to fight back on a daily basis the love of God is the greatest force that we could ever come into contact with and it's a love that seeks to restore us into the kingdom of God God's love is restorative doesn't matter what you've done doesn't matter where you've gone. God's love seeks to bring you back and put a ring on your finger that reminds you that you belong to him. You see, the love of God, a lot of us, we would write people off because of the the things they've done to us or because of the appearance of what we think they've done to us. We'd write them off. But God says, I'll run to you if you just come back. As the musicians come this morning, Can I tell you that the Father's love is waiting for you to turn to Him? And we have a great Father who loves us great. This morning, the Father is waiting for you to turn to Him. And when you turn to Him, He's going to place that ring of relationship on your finger. Well, the Father's love is seeking you this morning. The Father's love is running after you. And this is one of the characters that I love about the father. And then I'm done. When the youngest boy comes walking back down the path, coming to the house, the father sees him and runs out to where he's at. I love that. He didn't wait for him to get up to the porch. He didn't wait for him to get inside the house. He ran to him out where he was at. Later on in the chapter, when the older son who's been working out in the field sees the party, the scripture says he refuses to come into the house. And you know what the father's response is? He runs out to where the son was. 
You see, the kind of love that God is telling us about, that Jesus is revealing to us in these words, is the kind of love that shows us that God wants a relationship with you. You've not gone too far. You've not done too much for God to love you still. This morning, maybe we need a reminder of just how much God loves us. I ask you to stand. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Just for a few moments, would you think on the love of God? Maybe you've been afraid to embrace God's love because you feel like that you're you're too far gone. You've done too much. I'm saying, preacher, you don't know my mistakes and you don't know the path that I've walked in this life. And you know you're right and it doesn't matter. I don't need to know. God knows and he still wants relationship with you. God knows and he still wants to have a communication with you. Why? Because he loves us as a father. This morning the father loves you. And I pray that you can feel that father. Just let us feel your love this morning. The extravagant, enduring, certain, restorative love that you have for us. Lord, I pray that God, that if there's any in here this morning, God, that they don't know you as their Savior. God, just let them, let them feel you calling their name. Let them know that you love them, no matter what. No matter where they've been, no matter what they've done, let them know that you love them. Lord, even those that are watching this, Lord, no matter what day it is that they see it, Father, let them know right now, right this second as they hear these words that you love them. Because it is your love that motivated you to send your son. It is your love that motivated you to give us a restorative name. It is your love that motivated you to make a place for us in eternity with you. God, thank you for your love for us. This morning, we're going to sing a couple of more songs. You can remain in an attitude of prayer, or you can praise and sing with us. But I want to tell you this morning that these altars are absolutely open, and if you need to come and experience the love of the Father in heaven, Come and pray this morning, and we will pray with you. Let's sing.
Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my King. Yes, you Jesus, you are my King. Yes, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die? It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I honor you in all we do. Let us honor He wants me to go right into the song, but uh, before I do that, sorry, Dad. I'm usually really bad at saying Happy Father's Day, and I don't say it till like 11:59 p.m. Just for the comedic value of it. But uh, <coughs> Happy Father's Day. Couldn't have asked for a better, better dad. I didn't get to choose, uh, but pretty lucky because I see a lot of homes that don't even have a dad. A lot of people don't get a dad that'll spend any time with them, a dad that'll be there at all. And this guy has four kids and, and another kid living with us and two dogs, and we've had several foster kids go in and out of the house. And, and then he has to deal with mom, and mom's crazy. So, and that might, she might say it's otherwise, but uh, I got the best dad on the planet, which other people will argue with me, but... From my point of view, I got the best dad. He's taught me to be who I am. He's taught me to go where I'm going to go. And, and I'm just thankful that God has blessed us as a family with, with you. I love you. Let's sing about the love of God. His erring 
child, he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and so it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels so of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall with men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains go God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and Let's go right into this one. Think about this as we sing it. Could we with thee the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the law of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole Though stretched from sky to sky The love of God The love of God How rich and pure How measureless and strong It shall forevermore saints and angels song love of God the love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Let's sing it one more time. Just take out all instruments. Just sing it. The love of God.
Man, the love of God will forevermore endure and remain the saints and angels' song. I'm so thankful for God's love this morning. How about you? God loves you. And if there's anything I want you to remember as you go about the rest of your day today, it's that God loves you. Don't forget it. And if you notice, he shows you every day. Amen. We'll be back here tonight, Wednesday night. Man, we had a great service Wednesday night. And uh, I'm really excited about Wednesday night services now. So be back here tonight, starting at 7 o'clock, Wednesday night services. We continue through the book of Joshua. And we'll see you then, okay? Let's bow and close in prayer one more time. God, we thank you, Lord, for loving us as a father. Lord, we thank you for our fathers, our dads, that you gave us here on this earth to love us, to protect us, to provide for us, to take care of us. Father, the dads that are still here, Lord, we, we pray that, God, that we show them that we love them. Fathers, our, our daddies that you've taken on home already, Lord, love on them for us and tell them we said thanks. Father, again, we thank you. Happy Father's Day, Lord. Give us a great, safe, wonderful, blessed day. And we will, we will honor you not just today, but, Father, we will honor you every single day of our life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Go in peace, church. God bless you. Have a great Father's Day. Church, I've been informed that I said twice I'll see you tonight at 7. I'm crazy. Wednesday night at 7. Wednesday night at 7. If you come tonight, you won't see me.